off the heels of the AFC and NFC championship games last night. I wanted to bring someone in to chop it up about what the hell did we see yesterday? There was a lot to get into from the NFC with Brock Purdy, the Eagles making it to the Super Bowl yet again. And then the AFC wheels, the battle of the QBs from Patrick Mahomes to Joe Burrow. But was it Chris Jones who really stole the show? We will get into all of that and more. Maybe some NFL offseason early storylines with my next guest. He is a NFL analyst. He is a podcast host on the Believe in Lions podcast on the Believe Podcast Network, as well as player profiler on YouTube. I'll make sure to have all of his information in the podcast in the YouTube description. So let me bring in my guest here. He is Jack Cavanaugh, NFL analyst, Believe in Lions, player profiler on YouTube. Let's see if we can get him up here nice and smoothly with the transition. There we go. Uh, Jack, pleasure to meet you again. And it's, it's, as always, welcome into the The SMD Podcast. Pleasure to be on the show. Pleasure to meet you. Always excited to talk football with another content creator, especially after final two games. We've got one left, but been saying all leading up to that. We've got three football games left. Enjoy it while you can. And so while they were weird, I certainly enjoyed yesterday. For sure. And let's, I, I think we should start with the more, at least the more exciting game. Maybe we thought Purdy, if he stays upright, if the elbow didn't go boom, maybe that game could have been a little bit, little bit more compelling. But when it comes down to the Bengals and the Chiefs, let, let's get right to the juicy stuff of it. Did, do the Bengals have an argument with how the officiating was, specifically in that second half? I mean, they can complain. It was bad officiating. But at the same time, they had the ball back even after that second, third, and th nine that we had to deal with and all of that. They got the ball back. They had a chance to win with two minutes left. And Joe Burrow throws a ball that gets tipped and an interception. And so, yes, there are complaints to be made. But I also see people complaining about the Joseph Asai penalty. That was just blatant. You have to call exactly. that. There's no way yep. you can ignore that. Just because there were some bad calls earlier in the game does not mean that the refs cost them. So I get the frustration. You're allowed to be angry. But at the end of the day, you still lost the game. Yeah, and I, I think the funny thing about it is, is that, you know, to your point, the, the play with Fosai, that was so blatant. You can't worry about the piling on effect because, yeah, you can, you know, talk about some calls earlier in the quarter. But to be quite honest... They were able to advance in the drive despite those calls. So it's not like those calls specifically stopped a drive or took a touchdown off the ball or a pivotal first down or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. They were frustrating. They were weird. They were annoying. I would be angry at them if I was a Bengals fan, but you still had your chances to win and you did not take opportunity. And football is such a game of margins that... right. It comes down to you winning the game, and you couldn't do it at the end. Yeah, if if you could t talk me to talk me through to what you saw in regards to Chris Jones. I think he's someone that certainly unheralded, certainly underrated. Romo tried his best to like keep us in the loop of where he was on the field to kind of amplify his impact on the game. But talk about his play yesterday. He he seemed to be a man amongst boys yesterday. Yeah, he really was the game wrecker for the Kansas City Chiefs defense. I saw that he had eight pressures, and on all eight of his pressures, two of them he got a sack himself. There was a third sack by a different teammate that he forced Burrow into. And then the others were five in completion. So Chris Jones, every time he got pressure on Joe Burrow, it resulted in a loss of yards or no gain on the play. Chris Jones just absolutely dominated, and that's what happens when you have a patchwork offensive line like the Cincinnati Bengals did. They spent so much money to not be in the same position as last year where they were dealing with just right. turnstiles. And then through no fault of their own, through injuries, it just happens again. So it's devastating. But that is not to take away from what Chris Jones did. Crazy enough, that was his first NFL sack in the postseason last night. That was Couldn't crazy. believe that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Same here. Same here. I think that whole, you know, a lot's been made of the Bengals defense and the impact they have and the way that they can apply pressure, blitzing, what have you. And going forward into looking into this potential Super Bowl matchup, I was unaware that the Chiefs were second in sacks. Like, it's just like a quietly talked about yeah. uh, thing where I was like, well, 
I expect the Eagles to be there because of all the D linemen they got. But the Chiefs, I literally have been all season just assuming it's just been Chris Jones and a bunch of dudes. But when you factor in Dunlap and guys like that, they clearly have been able to bring guys with pressure. And I knew Carl Loftus, the rookie, came on at the end of the year, that first round pick that they had from the Tyreek Hill trade. I knew he came on at the end of the year, but I didn't think that would have them so high up, truly. That is right. That catches me off guard. But at the same time, Philadelphia has a better offensive line than Kansas City does. So that exactly. will play a big factor coming up. But it's gonna be a good game. Great game. Great game. I'm 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 so looking forward to it. Uh it, if we're looking at this whole thing of Burrow head, Burrow versus Mahomes and getting into the classic matchup of these two young elite QBs. Because as much as I, I'm a big Mahomes guy, but I don't want to shade Joe Burrow in any sense. He has certainly earned all of the credibility that he's been given. But did we see anything from Burrow yesterday that make you think it's clear Mahomes is one, maybe Burrow who's somewhere trying to put as one or one A, maybe he showed some showed something to you yesterday that made you think there's a pretty big difference between Mahomes and Burrow. So I've been on the bandwagon since last year's playoffs that Joe Burrow is QB one in the NFL. And part of okay, that let's is go. what he's done to revive the Cincinnati Bengals. They went from the Andy Dalton years where they couldn't win a playoff game to before that they were just the lowly Cincinnati Bengals for all those years. Carson Palmer still couldn't win a playoff game. And then they were kind of at the bottom of the NFL. They were the Cincinnati Bengals were a joke for so many years, much like the Detroit Lions, a joke for so many years. Buffalo Bills, so many years where they are just the punchline of the NFL. And so when I say Joe Burrow's the best quarterback in the NFL, it's with the fact that he revitalized a city. He went from LSU where he turned the Tigers into the best college football team of all time. And then goes into the NFL his first year, tears his ACL second year, wills them to the playoffs, to the Super Bowl himself. And most importantly, the thing that I hang my hat on that Joe Burrow is the best quarterback in the NFL. And it's one that no one can argue with is Joe Burrow is the only quarterback that could convince the Cleveland Brown or not the Cleveland Brown, sorry, the Cincinnati Bengals to spend enough money to build an indoor practice facility. Now, that being said, okay. Patrick Mahomes is the most talented quarterback in the NFL. That is indisputable it's all of the intangibles for joe burrow that have me on this path that i've gone down but patrick mahomes is just he's he's a superhero he's a literal superhero out there the fact yeah. that he was playing with a high ankle sprain which is a four to six week injury and he's just playing on it because he has to is eight just, days okay <laughs> it's yeah. it's yeah. incredible he is literally superman he's wolverine he's Whatever superhero comparison you want to give him, that is Patrick Mahomes. So to answer your question, Joe Burrow, he disappointed yesterday. He did mm -hmm. not stack up with Mahomes, but in their past three meetings, he's outperformed Mahomes. So I just can't wait to see this rivalry go back and forth. I take Burrow because it's the contrarian pick, but make no mistake, Patrick Mahomes is just so freaking talented. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think the one thing f with me – with Mahomes is I think this year has kind of showed me more than years prior because in years prior, I mean, you give any QB Tyreek Hill and Kelsey, you should put up at least above average stats. And then you add in Mahomes' skill set and then we saw the numbers. He was able to put up video game like numbers. But this season, where it's literally Kelsey and nothing else, whereas you you, you might get a flash from Scantling, you might get a flash from Hardman when he was healthy. You might get a flash from McKinnon or whoever, but week in, week out, it was literally Mahomes and Kelsey going to take this team offensively as far as they can go. This season, to me, cemented the fact that if he's not two, you know, he's if he's not number one, he's no lower than two to me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The fact that this was supposed to be a rebuild year for Kansas City. They right. traded Tyreek Hill knowing that he was going to cost too much, and they, they say, you know what, we'll take – a down year. You know, we won't have the explosive offense that we usually have. We'll regress for a year. All these other teams, the Buffalo Bills, the o or Las Vegas Raiders, the Chargers, they're all going all in. The Broncos with Russell Wilson. Right. All these teams around us, they're going to go all in. We're going to quietly rebuild. We're not going to full rebuild. It's going to be a reload. We're going to have weapons-ish, but they're just kind of guys. And all Patrick Mahomes does is put out the best quarterback performance of the year. He's the MVP, clearly. 
Jalen Hurts had a chance if he didn't get injured, but Patrick Mahomes, MVP, right. and now he's in the Super Bowl in the Crazy. rebuilding year. Yeah, yeah, insane, insane. So I don't get it. I don't. Yeah, it's it's, it's really tough to to imagine what this team will look like once they now can build off the momentum of this. Win or lose, this season's a win because, as you said, this was supposed to be a rebuild year. So now if they get Kadarius Toney into the fold, into the offense, we know he has the talent. Don't know about everything else, but at least we know he has the raw ability to be able to be a game break on the field. If they go in the draft or go into free agency again and go find another guy to fill in maybe that Tyreek Hill role, I mean, who's who's to say this team can't come back? But with all the talent in the AFC, as we're talking about Burrow, we can't forget about Josh Allen and, and the Buffalo Bills. And then who knows with a team that might jump up and flash. We, we, we thought maybe Miami might be in that mix. There's a lot of teams. Baltimore, if they figure what if they pay Lamar, maybe they can take a step and jump into that mix. This whole AFC, you know, r- real quick, just kind of r- r- run me through your thoughts on just this AFC and the 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 future of it because there's so many young quarterbacks with so many of these franchises. How do you see this shaking out ultimately? Well, you want to say how young the AFC is Patrick Mahomes at what? 27. I think he turns 28 this year, but I think he's still 27. He was the old man in the room in the AFC playoffs. Yeah, he was the oldest. And even in the NFC, Dak Prescott, 29 was the oldest in the playoffs in general. So you got a Patrick Mahomes who's going to be elite for five plus years, probably longer than that. But let, let's just say five. Josh Allen, he's going to be around for quite a while. Joe Burrow, Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence has arrived. He one, was yeah. the next Peyton Manning coming out of Clemson, and he sucked in his first year just like Peyton Manning did. And now all of a sudden he makes the playoffs something Peyton Manning couldn't do in his second year. So we've got him to worry about. We've got probably Bryce Young, who's going to get drafted to the Houston Texans, I believe, could end up somewhere else, could end up with the Colts, but they're looking for quarterbacks too. So we truly, there's a lot of bad quarterback play in the NFL. There's a lot of quarterbacks that are going to be shifting teams in the NFL, but we truly live in a blessed time with all of these elite quarterbacks that we're going to get to see for years to come. It's going to be a fun AFC for a lot of years. Herbert, yeah, too. And, Not about Herbert. Oh, yeah. Herbert, look, and, and that's what to me is so amazing when, you know, I, I'm the type of person that I believe whoever has the most talent more times than not will win. You can scheme me to death, but if I have the horses, my talent's going to overcome your scheme. With all these young quarterbacks, are, are you of the mindset, if you had to build a team today and you're in the AFC, are you willing to take, I want the elite of the elite at the QB position, and then I'll depend on him to get us home, kind of like the, the Ravens with Lamar? Or would, would you do it like the Chargers with Justin Herbert, where I have an Eckler, I have a Keenan Allen, I have a Mike Williams when he's healthy. We we unearthed Gerald Everett this year. Well, I'm just going to surround this guy, or like with the Dolphins in Tua. We're going to go get Tyreek Hill. We're going to go draft Waddle. We're going to go figure out what to do with Gasecki. We're going to bring in all these running backs and just have maybe a second tier, if you really want to tier these guys, a second tier QB and just surround them with talent or give me the top-notch guy like a Mahomes, like, like, like a Lamar, and have them take us as far as they can while we supplement them with little bits and pieces here or there. I think the answer is you want the quarterback first and foremost, but we saw with Josh Allen just this this playoffs what happens when you only give him one option one elite receiver in Stephon Diggs and then you've got Gabriel Davis who inconsistent Dawson Knox inconsistent all of the Mm. slot players they have inconsistent whereas Patrick Mahomes yeah he's only got Travis Kelsey but MVS is good for a player too Juju has his moments too there are guys that can show up whereas in Cincinnati They have guys that will show up with an elite quarterback on a rookie deal. Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, they could upgrade the tight end position from Hayden Hurst. But I think the key is having one of those elite quarterbacks and you don't need necessarily to overspend for that elite wide receiver one. Instead, you want to get enough where the quarterback can take advantage of his, his gifts and spread it around, even if... It's two MVS and Juju. Yeah. Even having those options instead of having to throw the ball to Isaiah McKenzie. You know what I mean? Devin Singletary. 
Right. So off of that, have the Ravens let down Lamar Jackson? Oh, yeah, absolutely they have yeah. in many yeah. ways, in many ways, because people will point to the draft capital. Well, they've spent a bunch of draft picks on receivers, okay, but they traded the only, they, they drafted two first rounders and they traded one of them. Yes. And then most of their other contributions have been bad picks in the third round, like Miles Boykin or fourth, fifth, oh. sixth, seventh rounders. So that's that's not really an investment. I'll give you Rashad Bateman. I'll give you Devin Duvernay, but that's really it for Lamar Jackson. And I also right. think they failed him this season with the MCL because we just heard for week after week, oh, Lamar is actually healthy. You know, he's he's healthy and he just doesn't want to be out there. He He's holding out for a contract. And at any point, the Ravens could have stopped that because when Lamar comes out and says, I have almost a grade three MC or PCL yeah. strain, PCL, yeah. not MCL. Sorry, Players but. where we're coming out to defend him saying they see him limping around the building, the, the yeah. facility. Yeah. His teammates are defending him. He says, I almost have a grade three. It's a grade two, but that might still require surgery because a grade three means it is fully torn. And the Ravens this whole time, they just let the rumors per percolate just like they did with Ronnie Stanley, just like they did with Derek Very Wolf. True. So I'm seeing a pattern recently where the Ravens are failing their players and they come out publicly and say, we want Lamar Jackson back, but it takes two to tango. For and sure. then you hear the contract offer from last year, $55 million guaranteed less than Kyler Murray. Can't Not even that. comparing yeah. it to the Deshaun Watson one. We're comparing right. to Kyler Murray. So I think the Ravens have failed Lamar Jackson in so many different ways, both health-wise, both not getting him the weapons, and in giving him the money he deserves. So will he be back? I'm starting to think where there's smoke, there might be fire, and Lamar Jackson might be headed to the NFC. Wow. I, I, I think that would be such a travesty of justice for them it to just, just for them to just have to do that because he has earned it. He has outperformed whatever contract they, they have currently put in front of him that he's turned down. And look, the, the, the Sean Watson may have tricked the system. He may have found the one dumb owner who's willing to give him $230 million guaranteed. But you have to give me more than Calamari. You can't, you can't yeah. lowball me and not at least offer me $1 more than Calamari. I've been an MVP. I'm the face of the team. You could argue even face face of the league in that conversation anyway, in terms of Madden covers, popularity, stuff like that. Kyler Murray gets to make more money than me, guaranteed. Like I, I don't understand the rationale from a Ravens organization standpoint where we're not going to give you Deshaun Watson money. Okay, cool. But you can't then lowball me and not even offer me Calamari money. Like that, that that's laughable. It is. It really is. And the, the market is the market because I've made this point and you'll have people on Twitter who don't fully understand the the entirety of the situation. Oh, well, you know, Pat, he's that's more than Patrick or that's only $10 million less than Patrick Mahomes is guaranteed. Yeah, he signed that contract three years ago. That's not how quarterback market works. Correct. We go based on the recent contracts. We go based on Kyler Murray. We go based on Russell Wilson and you offered him $30 million less than Russell Wilson. So no, this don't come out here with the well, it takes two to tango when you're out here tangling with a low ball offer like that. Yeah, for sure. It's yeah, uh, it, it's definitely something worth monitoring. And I hope Lamar Lamar will get his money. I just think it would be such a better story for him to get that money in Baltimore with everything that he has given to that franchise. But if he has to go to the NFC, I mean, so if, if he goes to the NFC, what, what, what team do you think? And I have a lot of. Falcons fans on my timeline and they, they've been talking about Lamar since last year. So do, do you think it's the Falcons or where else do you see him potentially landing if he does leave to the NFC? That's where I'm leaning. They have more money okay. than anybody else in the NFC to pay Lamar Jackson. They've got the weapons that would help him thrive as well because we've never seen him with actual weapons. Now we get Drake London and we get Kyle Pitts. So right. It, there are other teams in the AFC with more money than the Falcons, but they don't need a quarterback. The Chicago Bears, I guess, have more money than the Atlanta Falcons, but they don't need a quarterback. So right. when you look at the cap situation, the Seahawks could, but that seems like they're in on Geno Smith. Atlanta Falcons really seem like the team that have what Lamar would want and the money to get him. 
Hey, so I'm 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 gonna make sure to clip that for for the Falcons people on my timeline because they 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 they've been throwing memes at me all year long about Lamar and how he looks in the uniform. They got the gifs already ready to go. So uh, that that is Jack Cavanaugh. He is a host NFL analyst for Believe Network, Believe Sports Network, the podcast over there, Believe in Lions. Also play a profile as well. Play a profiler on YouTube as well. Check out his good work, his great work. We're going to make sure all of his uh, social network stuff is in the podcast and YouTube description. I know we, we, just, we just got off on a tangent there, just going off into storylines, but I just think some of that stuff is so fascinating. But let's see if we can get back into the NFC Championship game. So clearly, Hassan Riddick destroys all of our hopes of a competitive game on the first drive of the game. Your man's Brock Purdy has the bomb elbow, potential tear in the UCL. We'll monitor that in the offseason. But outside of Brock Purdy, let's put Purdy at 100%. Was the outcome going to be any different in your eyes? No, I don't think so. Maybe they score another touchdown. Maybe they score a touchdown and a field goal. But at the end of the day, the defense still got walloped by Jalen Hurts. He was slicing and dicing them. And people want to point out, Oh, well, Jalen Hurts personally, you know, he didn't have that eye popping of stats. Well, that's because the running backs also were breaking off some gains. They were able to get in the end zone. So he didn't have to do the eye popping thing, put the team on his back like he does so often. Regardless, they win this game. Ky- or not Kyler Murray. Sorry. So distracted about that conversation. <laughs> Brock Purdy is yeah. not putting up enough points to compete with the Philadelphia Eagles offense. So it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, they lose by. 14, 21, instead of whatever they lost by, it's right. still a massive L. Yeah, I, I think the the one th- the one takeaway from for me, and, and we, we talked about it before we started recording, is if you're John Lynch and you're Cal Shanahan, that injury now throws into question whatever you were thinking about in the offseason in terms of quarterback, because it's clear they're going to let Jimmy G walk because they're going to get a third-round pick for him regardless. But then you have, we don't know what, what they're going to do with Trey Lance. There's the black cloud hovering of, you know, avocado ice cream guy, Tom Brady. And now you have to figure out Brock Purdy off of a bum elbow. So now if you're John Lynch, now your whole QB death chart or your, your offseason targets gets way more murky with this injury. It does. It really does. And especially because it, it could require surgery that we're hoping it doesn't, but if not, it's six to eight, eight week injury. He'll be back with plenty of time. But even before the injury, there was still questions of what the 49ers were going to do this offseason because scenario one, according to Ian Rappaport, was Trey Lance versus Brock Purdy. And Brock Purdy, he's going to be the incumbent. He's going to have that inside edge, but it's still an open competition. But there's door number two, which was Tom Brady coming to the San Francisco 49ers playing for his hometown team. And you know, if the 49ers are considering Tom Brady and that's something that we can accept, they're also considering a Derek Carr who's over there in Las Vegas. They're also considering an Aaron Rodgers who was a California kid himself and wanted to right. play for the 49ers a couple of years ago. There was all the talk of before they drafted Trey Lance, could they get Aaron Rodgers? So you know, if they're considering Tom, they're considering Aaron Rodgers, they're considering Derek Carr. So that's at least five different quarterbacks down yeah. two different doors yeah. that we're looking at right now. And if you had to pick one, who are you picking? I think ultimately they will go with the combination of Purdy versus Trey Lance. And I think if he's healthy now, and I think right. Purdy will start the season. But at the same time, Trey Lance, we knew he was going to get off to a slow start in the NFL, so I'm not going to hold his first couple games this year against him. I think at some point, the raw physical talent of Trey Lance is going to take over when they figure out, okay, Brock Purdy has us good enough to you know beat up on bad teams and hang beat, beat the mid-teams, but Brock Purdy is not good enough to compete with the Philadelphia Eagles offense, to compete with the Jalen Hurts. Trey Lance, despite his flaws, he actually does offer that upside. So I think it's going to be Purdy before eventually being benched when they learn they can't win shootouts for Trey Lance. So here's my question with that, right? Because I think their window is within the next one to three years in terms of this core current group. Do they have the 
the cachet or the time to wait for Brock Purdy or Trey Lance to be of that level because we saw Purdy at times look like he was just smoothly transitioning into being the guy, but then he also showed you some flashes of being Mr. Irrelevant. So clearly that's gonna that's gonna take some time. And Trey Lance, as you said, we knew that was gonna take a take a take some time. And then you had the injury all into it. It feels like we're gonna have to start all the way from scratch with him. Does does that QB position align with the window of mortgaging what they did for Christian McCaffrey? What they have in Debo, IU, Kittle, all like Trent Williams. Do we have the timelines aligned to where the young QB is going to be good enough to be able to maximize the back end of the prime of these guys that they've all mortgaged their futures for? That is a really good point. And I think that's why Tom Brady remains in that picture because he's the one they wouldn't have to give up draft picks for, whereas Derek Carr and Aaron Rodgers, right. they would. So, yeah. That does throw a wrinkle into it, especially with Christian McCaffrey back for one final year. But is Tom Brady that we saw in Tampa Bay for this year, is he the guy to bring them that stability or is that mm. just another headache waiting to happen? Yeah, that's tough. That's I mean, if if I'm John Lynch, I would go all in for Rodgers. I don't I don't think the Packers would do it because it's within the conference. But yeah. I would mortgage everything if it was even a sliver of a possibility. But I do think if you get Brady, I think every, anywhere Brady goes, it's a one-year deal. Even if the contract is two yeah. years, I'm sure there'll be language that he can get out after one year or the team could get out after one year. So I would take that one-year gamble. And he, the way that he went to Tampa, he's getting those same things. He went to Tampa because he needed more talent around him. He needed a better play caller around him. And he got that with Arians and Evans and Godwin. He went and got Antonio Brown. He went and got Gronk to come out of retirement. He went and recruited Fournette down there to come play in Tampa. He can do the same thing, but the team is already set. He literally just has to show up and he's the guy. You got Kittle. You got Ayuk. You got Debo. You got Christian McCaffrey. He's got a good offensive line. He's got Shanahan as his play caller. I mean, I, if I'm Brady, I'm just waiting. I'm calling John Lynch. I would have been calling him as the clock expired yesterday. Like, I'm ready. Like, figure it out with Tampa, but I'm ready. Elite offensive line, elite defensive line. And Rob Gronkowski, he's flirting with coming out of retirement. He said a couple of weeks ago that he's bored. Him and, Gr him and Kittle on the same? Woof. Right? Nasty. Because you know Gronk is going to follow Tom Brady next year. Yeah. He's, he said, oh, I would consider playing for Joe Burrow. I'd consider playing for Josh Allen. No, you're not doing that, right. Gronk. You, right. You're catching passes from Tom Brady. Exactly. So, yeah, I, I think that's something to to really be careful for. If, if I'm John Lynch, like maybe he does need to figure out if, you know, because Purdy and, and Trey Lance, I don't think even if you make Trey Lance available, you're not going to get that much for him. So I think you're just stuck with him and Purdy. No one's going to trade for Purdy. So even if you go get a Brady, it's a short term solution, but you can still have these guys learning under yeah. Tom Brady and, and you know getting that acumen into the Shanahan system. And they'll be ready to go in a year or two once Brady, we assume, finally retires or moves on to the next spot to go try to milk another ring out of. I was going to say, you think he's going to retire after that contract or you think he's just going to go to the next team as the mercenary? Dude, who, the who, what, yeah, yeah, for sure. He, he is a mercenary. I think he really wants to walk, walk away with 10 rings. I think he thinks he could get both hands filled with rings and be, on, be like the Bill Russell of the NFL. I really think he, he thinks he could do that. I would not put that past Tom Brady. All I know is they, he, he got mad the other day when he was asked, are, are, are you retiring? Are you coming back? Got a little bit annoyed by that, but come on. We all know you're coming back, Tom. Right. And, and here's the funny thing. Like, I'm, I'm not that mad at him for his performance in Tampa this, this past season because he didn't want to be there. He wasn't planning to be there. We, 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 we got the information of how he had this alleged collusion with Miami and he was going to, become the player VP or whatever, and then unretire. And so we know he wasn't planning on being there. When you wrote that letter that was, uh, you know, mistakenly took as his retirement letter, it was really just saying, buy the Tampa. Like, I'm still playing. I'm just getting out of here. And so, to, like, to me, it was like he was just, it was on borrowed time anyway. Like, he was not as focused as he was. He had the whole thing with Giselle and the divorce and everything. That's a whole different matter. But in regards to his focus was never fully intent on Tampa, because that man was not trying to play as a Tampa Bay Buccaneer this year. Yeah, he wanted to be a Miami Dolphin with Sean Payton. And I don't know if you heard the Rex Ryan theory yesterday that oh, Sean no. Payton, Tom Brady, 
Could they still end up together? The Dolphins have said they're out. They're going to stick with Tua. But could the mm-hmm. Commanders, to drive up that sale price, because we know that they're selling the team, so could mm-hmm. Dan Schneider come in here and say, look, you're going to pay for Tom Brady and Sean Payton. We're adding those extra dollars in the sale because they are going to put tickets in butts. So you're welcome. Now pay me for the Commanders. Wow. I think it's less likely. I think that's Rex Ryan just theorizing. But I, I, I want chaos, so I want that to happen. I'm all <laughs> about chaos. So I, I love that. It's going to be a chaotic offseason. Just the fact that we have so many opportunities like this. Aaron Rodgers to the Jets or Derek Carr to the Jets or Derek Carr to right. the Buccaneers or where's Ryan Tannehill going to go and who's going to trade up because the Bears could trade back – or could the Bears True. draft a quarterback? Could the Cowboys draft a replacement for Dak? These are all stories that I've seen the past couple of weeks. So just prepare for the craziest. Is this the rare occasion where we're more excited about the NFL offseason than the actual su- Super Bowl? Because I feel like all the stuff that we just talked about, I, I don't know about the audience, but for me, I'm like, I'm way more interested in what's happening there and just all those storylines, all those potential scenarios than, oh, yeah, the, Ch- the Chiefs and the Eagles in two weeks. Should be a good game, but all right, where's Aaron Rodgers going? Where's Derek Carr going? What, what, what's John Lynch going to do? Are the Bears going to trade, you know, to take a QB and trade him or trade Justin Fields? Like, there's so many other storylines that's kind of low-key overshadowing the Super Bowl. Is, is that a real thing here? I don't want to say it is, but it really kind of has so far this off season. And it's not just been this week either, just for week after week, we've heard it's been NFL Sunday and oh, is Aaron Rodgers? Is he going to retire this? It's the playoffs, right? but we're still talking about that. That's all the news beforehand is it's the Derek Carr news beforehand. So all of the pregame broadcasts are just speculation about all of these big stories throughout the off season. People are buying into it, and it's almost, yeah, it's almost overshadowed the playoffs, which is too bad because it's been a really competitive playoffs with so many different teams that we've been excited about the potential to win. But it's going to be even a crazier offseason, and people love the crazy. Yes, it's it's, it's always about the transactions and just the hot stoveness, especially with fantasy football. It's all about who is who's, especially with Lamar. You're talking about a guy that's, uh, arguably a top five QB who is on the move. You're talking about Derek Carr, who some people have his top 10 ish or in that neighborhood. Anyway, he could be on the move. You're talking about Aaron Rodgers, who some think is the goat. You have Tom Brady, who a lot of people believe is the goat. All four of them could be on the move. And then you sprinkle in a little Daniel Jones, you're sprinkling in some, some Teddy B, some, 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 you know, Geno Smith. It's just so much movement where there's a lot of teams that feel they're just a quarterback away. If we could just get a quarterback, we've got everything else, or we have a few other pieces, but we just need that one quarterback. It, it just makes for this all season just be so topsy-turvy. It does, and even the teams that aren't a quarterback away, the entire NFC South is going to be looking for a quarterback. Both Jameis and Andy right. Dalton are going to be gone for the Saints. Marcus Mariota is going to be gone for the Falcons. They have Desmond Ritter, but they're not confident with him. Sam yeah. Darnold's gone, so he it's either Matt Corral or a P.J. Walker. They're going to be looking for a quarterback. Ugh. And then the Buccaneers. They haven't written off Tom Brady returning yet, but as of now, they're looking at Kyle Trask versus Blaine Gabbert in training camp, so they're going to be looking for QBs as well. And we haven't even touched on the running backs, all of the free no. agent running backs. we got Saquon, Josh Jacobs, Miles Sanders, Tony Pollard, David Montgomery, Damian Harris, Devin Singletary. S- the entire landscape of NFL offenses is going to change this offseason, both as quarterbacks and as running backs. Incredible. Incredible. Let, let's move forward to the actual Super Bowl, because I, I, I think the Purdy injury just kind of makes that game yesterday just kind of whatever. Like, all right, the Eagles overwhelmed them with their talent. Jalen Hurts looked confident in his running ability, especially in the second half. So he, he showed enough in regards to, I think, he, he admitted he's not healthy. Uh, none of us should expect him to be healthy with, with what he endured. But he certainly looked good enough. He still has A.J. Brown. He still has Devonta Smith. He has Dallas Goddard. He's got the three-headed running backs in Sanders and Boston Scott and Gainwell. So I'm, and then a dominant offensive line. So Eagles took care of business. In regards to Chiefs-Eagles, one storyline, I think the main storyline I'm going to focus on 
is the ability of the Eagles defensive line going up against the Chiefs offensive line. So much has been made about the Chiefs, you know, enhancing that that offensive line, especially from that that last Super Bowl against Tampa where they just got shredded. And they've made some some definitely some reinforcements there. They have definitely invested heavily into that. But the Eagles just have, it seems like they got two separate front fours that can come at you in waves and they can mix and match it. They're doing stunts and everything. What's the biggest storyline for you as we head into the Super Bowl with the Philadelphia Eagles and the Kansas City Chiefs? I think that's probably one and probably the other is going to be can Kansas City get pressure on Jalen Hurts? Because the Philadelphia Eagles, every single year, they build themselves up as a juggernaut in the trenches. So that's why, like you say, it's so important seeing how the offensive line that the, the Kansas City Chiefs have invested so much and how they hold up against the Eagles. But it's just as important on the opposite side. Is Jalen Hurts just going to be sitting back there in the pocket, being able to do what he wants? Is A.J. Brown going to be able to get open deep downfield? Is Jason Kelsey, Landon Dickerson, are they going to be able to handle Chris Jones? Lane Johnson, the right tackle tackle of the Eagles, he's playing with a torn adductor muscle in his groin. So he's banged up, but he is still mauling people out there. That is going to be the difference, is the trench play. Because the Eagles, yes, they have far better offensive weapons. A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith versus the wide receivers of the Kansas City Chiefs. No contest. It's truly Travis Kelsey versus everybody. Right. But the the trenches, that's where it's going to make the difference, is can Patrick Mahomes get time to hit his cast of characters, and can Jalen Jalen Hurts get time to hit his guys and escape the pocket. Yeah. I think as we get closer, we'll, we'll obviously, you know, get hyper analytical into these matchups and we'll be studying the injury reports. And clearly with the chiefs, you know, we're, we're monitoring not only um, Mahomes high ankle sprain, but then we have Kelsey in the back spasms. You know, you just have to monitor those two guys, especially. And then obviously with the Eagles is hurts and, you know, Goddard's just coming back from injury and, and things like that. And even Nicole Hardman for the Chiefs also just coming back from injury. We want to, we want to monitor that. So injuries will play a part here. But f- philosophically speaking, you know, Andy Reid, a lot's been made. And I think that this is the perfect thing for him to be going up against Philly. A lot of stuff they made about his time management or lack thereof back, back when he was in Philly. Now we've seen him become kind of elevated to where – no one's questioning anything about Andy Reid. He's he's got the QB. He's won the 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 elusive Super Bowl, and he's kind of been goaded. Now that he's going up against Philly, a team that low key is kind of tailor made to get after the quarterback and to maybe stop all these weapons because they have enough linebackers and I think safeties that I'm not saying they can lock Kelsey, but they can certainly make make it rough for him. They're certainly going to try to double him in some some kind of capacity. And you're going to dare a Van Der Scatling to beat you or dare a Hardman or even McKinnon out the backfield or even Pacheco on checkdowns. Like, if you're Andy Reid, how are you trying to get this team to face the Eagles? Like, like if, if you're trying to attack this Philadelphia Eagles defense, I'm making you Andy Reid. What are you telling Mahomes and those guys of how we're going to attack this Philadelphia Eagles defense? Oh, that that's tough because there's not any obvious glaring weaknesses. I think, I think there's going to be a lot of the horizontal, a lot of the the crossers across the field, making Philadelphia Eagles cover every blade of grass on the field. And they're a defense that can do it. They're a very fast defense with Darius Slay and Hassan Reddick and so on. But at the same time, they've got some older cornerbacks. Darius Slay, yes, he's older, but he's still elite speed. James Bradbury, on the mm-hmm. other hand, though, he can get caught in those crossers when they're up in man coverage. Just a step slower than some of these Kansas City receivers who MVS run in 4-3 still. So I think that's what we're going to be looking at is a lot of horizontal stuff. Yeah, there'll be some vertical because Patrick Mahomes always has his vertical in, but still nursing that ankle injury. It's going to be a lot of quick stuff. It's going to be a lot of crossing over the field and just making the Philadelphia Eagles defend absolutely everything. 
And as soon as you go too hard at one aspect, aspect, if you're too hard on Travis Kelsey, all right, well, Jarek McKinnon's running a route underneath him. So I think right. that, but at the same time, I'm no Andy Reid. I am, uh, <laughs> might, might get my, pl- my uh, weapons killed out there. Yeah. I, I think that that's the fun stuff about this, like getting the game within the game and just the, the chess match and all of that. And I think if you're, if, if I'm, if I'm Andy Reid watching the Eagles as much as I, I was forced to, um, the one thing I think is I think if you can just get to the second level, if you can get to those linebackers, not to say that they're the, well, no, let's just go ahead and say it out of the three levels. To me, that's the weakest part of their defense is, is, is the linebacker play. Yeah. If you can get past that D line, if you can create some lanes, whether it's through the running game or maybe with with the limited uh, mobility of Mahomes, and little quick stuff into the flats and look, little quick little check downs and curls. I think there's some gaps there where you can exploit them a little bit and force them to tackle. I think the one thing with the Eagles is sometimes they get a little bit erratic with their tackling ability and they can give up some yak. So my thing, I think you saw a lot of that yesterday with the Bengals and the Bengals are normally a a team that can tackle well, but just because of the fact that Mahomes wasn't able to move around so much and that he had to get the ball out quicker, as you mentioned, he had to check it down quick and just give the ball, give the ball to guys with space and let them create something. Let them wreak havoc after the after the catch. I think they're going to have to try to implement the same thing against Philly because that front four is going to get home. Hassan yeah. Riddick is not going to forget how to rush the quarterback in two weeks. So he's going to be in that backfield. Fletcher Cox, Jordan Davis, and Dominican Sue, Linville Joseph. Like it just it's just too many guys that are going to be in that backfield. So Mahomes is going to have to get rid of that rock, and guys in in spaces are going to have to make plays. Yeah, absolutely. And the linebackers that they, that they have there, TJ Edwards, Nicobe Dean, which funny enough, everyone was all pumped about Nicobe Dean. Wow, such a steal. Third round pick out of mm-hmm. Georgia. Really hasn't played this year. Instead, it's yeah. been Edwards and Kaiser White, who they brought over from the Los Angeles Chargers, who's a small. It's funny. They've got a smaller linebacker in White, who's a, a former safety, and he struggles sometimes with the tackling because he's small. And then there's Edwards on the other side who sometimes struggles because he is too big He's and too a little big, bit yeah. lumbering. So yeah. it's, it complements each other. But yes, this is something that they can take advantage of, especially I think that Jarek McKinnon very well. He and Isaiah Pacheco could end up being the keys of this game because Pacheco, he's been breaking out throughout the playoffs. Yeah, he's, he's been great. He's been great. I'm talking with Jack Cavanaugh. He is a host NFL analyst for the Believe Podcast Network. He hosts the podcast Believe in Lions, also on YouTube at Player Profiler. So support him and sh- give him some love in the comments there and make sure to check out all of the stuff I'm going to leave in the podcast description to follow him on socials and to support the platforms that he's on. As I wrap up here, Jack, and I always appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Uh, let, let's go ahead and get the generic prediction stuff out the way, and then maybe we could touch on some storylines be, be, before we wrap it up. So, Super Bowl, Eagles, Chiefs, what are you thinking? And a way too early, because clearly we're, we're two weeks out, but way too early prediction, what are you thinking? I'm thinking that Jalen Hurts is going to win the Super Bowl MVP over Patrick Mahomes. He's going to have his team up with just the phenomenal weapons that he has. It's, it's that's what is ultimately going to happen. The Eagles pass rush isn't going to be able to get home on Jalen Hurts consistently. Chris Jones, yes, he'll have a sack, he'll have some highlight plays, but it won't be consistent enough. And Jalen Hurts, he's going to sit back there, he's going to be able to make some plays with his feet. We're going to see four touchdowns, three through the air, one by okay. land by Jalen Hurts. Eagles going to win 31 to 27 over the Kansas City Chiefs. So it's going to be a fun game. It's going to be a high scoring game. It's going to be a game that comes down to the end. But I just think that Patrick Mahomes, better quarterback, slightly better year, MVP, still a much better team with the Philadelphia Eagles with a quarterback that's just this far behind in terms of the season he had. I, I I tend to agree with you. I, I was trying to rationalize and find a way to to make the Chiefs win, and it just kept coming back to there's just too many horses on 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 uh, Philly. Just too they have too many too, too it's too much talent. They could just overwhelm you with, 
I think San Francisco was the only team that could kind of measure up in terms of talent on both sides of the ball. And but at the most important position at quarterback, there was a clear difference. And we saw how that worked, even when he had to go to Josh Johnson. Um, but no, I, I tend to agree with you. I think right now, in a way too early prediction, I think the Eagles do go ahead and take the, the Super Bowl. I would uh, I would also agree that if they are going to win, Jalen Hurts is going to have to have that type of performance and procure the MVP trophy. So that, that that's hitting all the bets because the, the Eagles are the favorite in terms of the money line. They are the favorite in terms of the spread. And you also, if they're doing 31-27, that is hitting the over. So if you want to make, if you, if you want to ride along with Jack, that's Eagles and everything. You could parlay all of that if you want and try to cash out on, on the Super Bowl. We know that's one of the biggest betting days of the year. Um, but Jack, as we wrap up here, just some quick rapid fire storylines. Is there a chance Mike McCarthy is going to finish out his contract with the Dallas Cowboys? If you ask Mike McCarthy and Jerry Jones, yes. He, apparently they want him there as long as Tom Landry was there. How long? How much right. longer is his contract? I believe it's two years. I believe he signed a five-year deal. Uh, so he's entering I, year four. I think he's going to be out after this season. I do. I think that's part of why Dan Quinn stayed. So, yeah, I think year four will be the final season of it. But if they – I don't think Jerry Jones wants to do it, but I think he'll have to do it. And Dan Quinn will be sitting there. He'll want that job. Sean Payton will right. want that job. There will be plenty of candidates there. And that, that kind of goes into my next question. If you're Sean Payton, do you wait for that Dallas job? Or is there a, a more attractive job right now that's available than potentially a Dallas Cowboy job next year? I don't think there's a more attractive job unless the Arizona Cardinals are willing to give you more control than uh, just a regular coach, but they just hired a general manager. So I don't see them doing that. If they wanted Peyton to have that power, they would have hired him first. So if that's the case, then no, there's no job better than the Dallas Cowboys because Kyler, he's going to be out to start the year. Anyways, Denver, you got to fix Russell Wilson and tie your wagon to him. The Houston Texans, they would be a fun team, but they're a rebuild. So that's not really what Sean Payton's looking for at this point. And the Colts are just, you got Jeff Saturday just breathing down your neck, even if you it's do weird. get the job. Yeah. It's so weird. <laughs> it's so I, weird. I don't like it. I don't like what's going on with the Colts. Yeah. Um, and, but yes, and last, Cowboys. Cowboys, cool. Uh, last one. Are the New York Jets legitimately just a quarterback away? quarterback and another receiver away because to get Aaron Rodgers or to get a quarterback they're gonna need to cut Corey Davis and to get underneath the cap Mm -hmm. some contract moves that they make there and if they cut Corey Davis the starting wide receivers are Garrett Wilson who's elite Elijah Moore who's inconsistent and then Braxton Berrios in the slot or you can have Denzel Mims on the outside those are options then no they're not a quarterback away but if you can even get uh, so if uh, say Alan Lazard comes there and he's the wide receiver three, four, then even that scenario, yes, they're a quarterback away. They just need a li- one more piece on that offense to join. I, I shouldn't just assume it's Aaron Rodgers, but to join Aaron right. Rodgers. I mean, it's, it certainly appears all the tea leaves are saying, you know, especially with them bringing in Hackett, who, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't know how much I, I approve of that hire, but if you're telling me if you want Aaron Rodgers, you have to hire Hackett, then all right, I guess I'll do it. Um, That is Jack Cavanaugh. He is a host and NFL analyst for the Believe Podcast Network. Uh, Believe in Lions is one of the podcasts that he is the host of, also on YouTube at Player Profiler. Jack, thank you for taking the time out to uh, join me here on the DCND Podcast and chopping it up about NFL. Such a pleasure. So happy to be on the show. Thank you so much for having me and hope to be able to catch up with you soon. And once this Super Bowl's in the books and be able to look back at how wrong we both were. (laughs) Thank you so much, Jack. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.